Hello, everybody. Next up, we play host to Chelsea. Kickoff on Sunday is at 4:30 p.m. and get used to it. Buses replace trains on the C2C line, so as ever, check before you leave and all that sort of stuff. Ah, Chelsea then. Well, the summer arrival of the new boss, Mauricio Pochettino, coincided with what even the most jaundiced of their supporters would concede has not been the most successful of transitions from Russian money laundry into a more legitimate ownership, shall we say. Whilst for years the authorities seem to have absolutely no issue with the billions pumped in by Abramovich one way or another, the takeover by Todd Bowley has prompted scrutiny from the authorities, particularly those responsible for pretending to enforce the financial fair play rules. The main trick that Chelsea have used over the past few years has been to give players mega long contracts, thus writing off the player asset over a long period. For example, an £80 million deal then appears as a £10 million a year deal when the player signs an eight-year contract. Now, UEFA have outlawed this practice, but that's of no concern to Chelsea this season, as, hilariously, they haven't qualified for Europe. Of course, one of the ways around those pesky financial fair play rules has always been in to bring in more money through commercial activities. Sponsorship, for example. Manchester City's trick was to disguise money pumped in by the owners, which is not allowed, as money from sponsors, which is. Famously, Manchester City's owners once ordered their sponsor to pay them a full bonus for winning the FA Cup in the year they lost to Wigan. Such financial sleight of hand isn't actually available to Chelsea at the moment, as the principal source of such income, shirt sponsorship, rather depends on them having a shirt sponsor. The Premier League blocked their original choice of a TV station, lest the league's own TV partners have their noses put out of joint. And since the subsequent search for sponsors proved unsuccessful, their shirts will be unadorned this weekend, unless something happens fairly quickly. Domestically, the authorities haven't gotten around to changing their rules on contract lengths just yet, though it's in the pipeline and you can expect it any decade now. So it's been business as usual on the transfer front for Chelsea, as Daisy discovered during her research. The first arrival was striker Nicholas Jackson, who, as his name suggests, is a Gambian-born Senegalese international. The fee paid to Villarreal is reported as being £32 million, and... Unsurprisingly, the player has signed an eight-year contract. The next arrival was Christopher Ngunku, whose transfer fee from Fizzy Drink Leipzig came to £52 million. His six-year contract is one year more than the maximum period that's currently allowed by UEFA, but as mentioned, since they're untroubled by European competition this year, it's not an issue. Ngunku came up through the ranks at PSG and has ten full caps for the French without yet troubling the goal-scoring statistics. He'll be missing this weekend with a knee injury. The arrival of Portuguese youth international Diego Moreira is one that baffled many, the fee being precisely zero. The Belgian-born winger owes his birthplace to the fact that his dad was on the books of Standard Liège at the time. Daisy didn't get me the details of his contract length, but given that it was a free transfer, I guess it doesn't really matter how many years you write that much off. Now, normally one wouldn't give up column inches or airtime on an 18-year-old whose first action on arrival was to be loaned out. However, the instant departure of Angelo Gabriel does leave a part open in this year's Stamford Bridge Nativity play. The Brazilian came in from Pele's old club Santos before heading straight back out the front door to Strasbourg. They shelled out another £24 million for Ren midfielder Leslie Ugochukwu. Another youngster, the 19-year-old, has overcome the handicap of his parents spelling his given name the girl's way to be nicknamed the New Vieira, thus becoming precisely the 100th promising French youngster to be given that nickname. Defender Axel Diazzi fetched £38.5 million on his transfer in from Monaco. His arrival has football headline writers licking their lips in anticipation of his first bad game, so they can print the word disaster or variations thereof. Another six-year contract deal. He opened his account with the equaliser in last week's draw against Liverpool. What I thought were their last two signings made the trip up the M23 from Brighton. Keeper Robert Sanchez cost £20 million, and for a change he signed a seven-year deal. He's been capped at full level by the Spanish, although 
Here's possibly number three, maybe number two, in the order of succession to the Spanish goalkeeping berth. But I'm willing to go out on a limb here and suggest he's the only player selected at international level by the Spanish to have played for both Forest Green Rovers and Rochdale, both of whom were on his travel itinerary during his early days down on the south coast. The transfers of Moses Caicedo was finally concluded last week after the player plumped to move no further north than West London, despite or maybe because of Liverpool's interest. He had been looking for moves since January having been publishing messages that effectively beg Arsenal to come and get him. When Brighton played hardball and refused to let the player go, he ended up signing a contract extension as recently as March. That went well, didn't it? Chelsea stumped up £115 million for the player, trumping Liverpool's £111 million bid, and handing Casido a, yes, you've guessed it, an eight-year contract. I was just about to send Daisy off for a well-earned cup of tea and a biscuit, and perhaps one for herself as well, when the news arrived that they spent a further £53 million on Southampton teenager Romeo Lavio. Lavio had signed from Manchester City at the start of last season, and the citizens did have a buyout clause or buyback clause included in the deal, but apparently that doesn't kick in for another year, enabling Chelsea to annoy Liverpool, who were interested for the second time in a week. Oh, and since you're asking, six years apparently. So let's move on to the wild and wacky world of association football. Well, last week I commented on this year's refereeing flavours of the month. These are the annual tablets of stone handed down by the IFAB, combined with PGMOL's whims as to which of the laws of the game are to be more rigorously applied. Which PGMOL does it in a very patchy and inconsistent manner for a month or so to the end, that by November we're all scratching our heads and saying, for example... Whatever happened to that initiative to stop players surrounding referees? This happens every year at the expense of referees getting even the most basic things right in the first place. Something that might just reduce, for example, the number of occasions when players surround referees. For example, the penalty not given against Manchester United the other night against Wolves. Now, that would have been bad enough without VAR, but to see two supposedly highly trained referees decide that a keeper is fully entitled to wipe out an opponent just goes to show that some of these initiatives are clearly just window dressing, designed as they are to treat the effects of an underlying problem rather than its causes. O'Neill at Wolves received the standard apology, which presumably, in its written version, is now available in a template form. So often do they have to use it. However, unless these apologies become exchangeable for league points, that will be of absolutely no use to Wolves, should they go down by a point next May. The officials involved in that fiasco have been stood down for a weekend, which begs the question of how anyone who didn't think that was a penalty, even after several replays, got to that level in the first place. Forrester on the end of a similar travesty as Rice pushed the ball away with his arm in the penalty box. Everyone seemed so intent on saying that it wasn't a penalty when it was so clearly was, that it looked like the decision had been pre-programmed into the system before the question was even asked. Elsewhere, we should raise one's hat to the distaff side of the football family once more on their qualifying for the World Cup final, with a splendid performance against the Matildas. Spain in the final will be a tough ask for sure, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Meanwhile, perhaps the Aussies, if based in London, will shut up about the fact that the weather allowed them to retain the ashes for just long enough to serve me my pint now. And so to us. Firstly, a bit about Bournemouth. Is it me who finds clubs trying to stir up an artificial atmosphere a bit, well, sad, really? Back in the 1960s and 70s, there used to be a thing called the Football League Review. This was a programme-sized magazine that clubs could insert into an actual programme as a method of producing a full-size programme with a decent number of pages without having to go to the bother and expense of writing all those pages. It now seems there's a musical equivalent of this, with Paul McCartney apparently having licensed the rights of Hey Jude to any club who hasn't managed to get a song of their own over the years. See also Brentford, and I suspect a fair few more this season. As for the game itself, I regard last weekend as two points dropped rather than a point gained. We were cruising to what at that point would have been a comfortable and deserved win. Then for some reason we stopped playing. We sat back with our feet up. When we won the ball, we abandoned any attempt at trying to use it in favour of lumping it forward in the hope that when it did actually go in the vague direction of Antonio, he might be able to hold on to it and bring other players into the game. This didn't happen. Yeah, the equaliser was a bit fluky, a miss-hit shot deflecting nicely into the path of Solanke. 
But frankly, we asked for it. The bright spot during the early part of proceedings had been the former Suchek, from whom a great weight seemed to have been lifted for some reason. Bowen's finish for the goal was, well, a bit useful, following some good work from Von Aels and the aforementioned Suchek. I guess generally if you're offered a point away from home, you'd normally take it, particularly on the opening day. However, there was still a sense that things could, should, perhaps, have been so much better. There was a bit of movement on the transfer front as James Ward-Prowse finally arrived. Having already played for Southampton, he will be in contention for this weekend. There are a lot of noises to the effect that he's not just a dead ball specialist, you know, which of course is true. However, it will be nice to have a justified sense of anticipation if and when we ever get a free kick in a decent position. It would appear that the Maguire deal is going nowhere, which will at least spare us the sight of an ear-cupping goal celebration should he have scored against the League Two side in the League Cup. Other irons are in the fire as we speak. See what I did there? And a couple more arrivals look, well, I won't say likely, I'll say possible. Just put that one down to experience. At least Bakhtar, whose future is still up in the air, showed no signs of being affected by all the brouhaha about his future. On the selection front, we've got no injuries to consider. Whilst, as mentioned, Ward-Prowse should be available to play, the noises surrounding Alvarez continue to be on the more cautious side of things, given his lack of a proper pre-season. We will see. And so to the prediction. Well, they looked good in places in the second half against the Scousers last week. However, they were supposed to look very much like a work in progress, and Liverpool got no little value over the quick, sharp break. On the other hand, as mentioned, when we were on the back foot last week, the sharp break wasn't happening, depending as it does on the ball being held up sufficiently to enable the midfield to push up quickly in assistance. Having mulled this over, I've elected to place the £2.50 that Daisy's financial fair play rules would have had me contributing to some household goods or other. I'm a stalemate. So, please, Mr Whitson, please place the whole lot on our two-all draw. Enjoy the game.